Hello, welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. Respect is something we tried to instill in our children when they were young. It had to be not only taught, but it had to be shown in order to be earned. I had to learn it myself growing up, but I never learned it from my parents. I was 11 years old, and it was a very harsh winter, so my father had his best friend move into our house for the winter because of the poor road conditions on the country roads. They put my older sister in my bedroom because her bedroom had two twin beds that he and I could use. One night I woke up and heard him and my mom in the other bed doing something. She saw me and told him to shut up, and I laid down and went to sleep. She was right, so I did. The next day I asked her about it. She denied it, saying it never happened and that I must have imagined it. Two weeks later, I caught them again, but this time they were in my parents' bed. Their affair resulted in my younger sister. To protect herself, my mother made me lie for the family. My father raised my half-sister as his own, but he turned to whiskey to numb the pain. I quickly learned that for most people, the truth didn't matter. It mattered to me, and to this day, I can't stand liars. I didn't approve of them or defend them. To many who knew me, it made me seem like a jerk sometimes. My own son learned the hard way that not talking to me was a big mistake in his life. Talking to his mother turned small problems into big ones. If she got to me before he did, they became emergencies. His mother knew what buttons to push, and it was a tough two years for him. But then he opened up to me. He realized that responsibility was a price he had to pay. He turned 16 this year, and he wanted his first car. He was the oldest of three kids. My youngest brought home a bad winter cold which she lovingly passed on to me, so I was awake. Suffering coughing fits, switching TV channels looking for something worth watching, when I discovered a new version of the cameras used by police officers. I texted my friend, asking him if there were models that could automatically forward the current video, when it became full, to a pre-programmed email address. Two days later, he called and told me about a product that did just that, but it didn't cost as cheap and only worked as intended if you had free Wi-Fi. Three of these devices ended up costing me over $2,000. I had David bring them to my office at work, along with a new laptop I bought for personal use. At the advertising company where I worked, we oversaw all commercial shoots, so I often traveled to different places for days at a time. The owners of the company were twin brothers named Robert and Stephen Walker. Stephen liked to gamble and never got married, we got along well. I'd been working there for years and was now making a good salary, so things were going well for me. When I was away, if my wife needed someone to accompany her, Robert, who is gay, would step in. It helped improve his public image. David Peters brought them to me at my office on Friday afternoon, along with a few other things for me to look over. The first thing he said I needed to do was to set up an email address in the cloud to which the videos would be sent. So I created a new account just for that. The cameras were no bigger than a diamond stud. They are all motion activated. So he had one of them embedded in the earrings. They could run for up to a week before requiring recharging, which was done wirelessly when a signal was detected. All she had to do was remove them and put them back in the box. Each camcorder had its own ID number and she presented it to everything they sent. He asked me why I needed them. I explained that my intuition was telling me something was wrong, but I didn't know what. I wanted to see for myself if my stomach was wrong. Sunday night I was scheduled to fly out for another trip. On Sunday I presented Deborah, my wife of almost 18 years with her gift. Diamond earrings that dangled down from a stud. She loved them and promised to wear them the whole time I was gone. Before heading to the airport, I stopped by the office to pick out a few necessities. This gave me the opportunity to leave a note in both of my boss's offices that I would call them if there was a problem. I installed one camera in each of their offices so that it would give an uninterrupted view of their desk. Both were directly connected to the sources they needed. I flew from New York to Whistler on the west coast of British Columbia because we had a two-week shoot scheduled for a new ski board commercial. Luckily, there was still snow on the high mountains. I'm not very tall only 5 feet 9 inches, weighing 166 pounds with a 32-inch waist. Deborah always jokes that I should wear boys' socks for ages 3 to 9. Her wrist was thicker than mine. We were both the same height, so she was around my size. 
she never wore heels. She had a nice chest, but anything bigger than her mouth would be too much for me. With her long blonde hair, she caught the eye of many men, but she always turned them down. When I was home, our life slowed down but stayed pretty normal. It seemed like our kids took after her side of the family, so I didn't have any reason to doubt it, just to be safe. And because we live in the city, we agreed to have our kids' DNA tested. We also fingerprinted them in case anything happened to them. On Wednesdays, while I did karate, she went to the theater, and the rest of the time we spent all of our free time together. On Fridays, we'd go out to dinner and dance because we both loved to dance. Weekends, when possible, we devoted to the kids. Deborah had her own home interior decorating company, which brought her a good income, and she had an answering service when she wasn't home. There were times when we were both loaded with work and were away from home. Both of our parents came to the rescue. As a result, our children developed deep relationships with both of them. On Monday evening, I started going through the information sent to me, sending daily updates on the laptop provided by the company. Then I opened mine and discovered three sent messages. The first one that caught my interest was a fight between Stephen and Robert. I'd had enough, said Robert. Being your muse so you can entertain Deborah is no longer fun. God, if Glenn ever finds out we're screwed, he's doing the work for three and without his abilities, we'll lose millions. Do you know how many clients we'll lose if he goes to our competitors? You've got to stop this now. I can't, said Stephen. I love her and according to Deborah, their three children are mine. Jesus Christ, you're an idiot, said Robert. I'm going to our corporate lawyer to ask him what we should do to protect the firm. If the truth comes out, we're all screwed. Glenn will destroy us all and he'll have every right to do so. I went to the bathroom to throw up. I called my older cousin Gordon, an expensive divorce attorney, and got him out of bed. Let's just say he wasn't impressed when I told him what I had learned. He told me to send all the videotapes I had received to him and he would start taking action on his end. The first thing he wanted to arrange was to get a sample of Stephen Walker's DNA. The videotapes themselves couldn't be used, but the written transcripts of the conversations could. He asked me to send a copy of my company's human resources manual to his office. He also asked me to find a notary public to fax him a power of attorney. Tomorrow, I'll get the private investigator we're working with to help in this case. They'll figure out the when, where, and how. It's a good thing you're in Canada. If you're not around, things will be easier because they won't be as cautious. If everything goes well, it might be a good idea to deal with them before you come back. I said it would be in a little less than two weeks, but it might take longer. The next morning, I called my assistant who handles everything I need during the shoot. I asked her to forward the instructions to my cousin's key office. Nora said she would do so and commented, I guess you finally found out. After answering yes, she said she would remain silent for now, but was willing to testify on my behalf if necessary. So management knew all along. I then stopped by the family doctor's office to explain that I needed to send copies of my children's DNA to the lawyers since I was drafting a new will. I charged the fee to my credit card. One of the Canadians working with us was able to get a notary. The rest of the week I just sent videos because I knew my cousin would explain everything. The rest of the week, I spent the rest of my free time fighting with myself not to go to the gym and get drunk. I now understood my father's pain. On Friday afternoon, after sorting out my plans for the weekend, I flew to Vancouver by helicopter and then drove all night to New York. After getting a rental car, I parked it on the street near my house. I was surprised to see relatives picking up our three children. Half an hour later, Deborah came out, wearing a new dress and high heels that hugged her body. When she left, I turned off my alarm clock and went to my office to get what I call 16 journals. They had the dates of each trip, what happened, and where I was. These logs had saved me from legal trouble more than once. An hour later, I was at Gordon's house, sitting in his kitchen discussing what he had found out. A DNA sample had been taken from Steve and we were waiting for the results of the comparison. They had also discovered the penthouse that the two had owned for 22 years. The neighbors thought they were a civilian couple, and he had proof that they were both there so regularly that the neighbors thought they worked weekends and nights. Twice a week, they had a house cleaning company come to their house. He had an affidavit confirming that they were a civil couple even before we met. 
Her firm's only client was a limited liability company that sold and bought inexpensive apartment buildings, then remodeled them, and sold them to new buyers at inflated prices as furnished apartments. This firm was wholly owned by Stephen Walker. The company's tax records showed that Dibber was making over half a million a year after expenses, but was extracting less than 80000 for herself. My children might not be mine, but were they Stephen's? That remained to be seen. Since Debra was playing me, had she done the same to Stephen? Gordon told me that my mother would be picking up the kids next weekend, because I wasn't expected home until at least Monday. We agreed to burn the bitch, her lover, and company. When she was in her primary residence, their penthouse, I would take out of the house what I felt she should have. I told him I'd be flying on Friday night. He would cancel all the cards in both names and empty half of our accounts before they were frozen by court order the day I was coming home. I flew back to Canada to finish filming, working twice as hard. Robert Walker met me at the airport as I was getting off the plane Saturday morning. He was surprised that I had finished filming early and was confused because he couldn't understand why our meeting couldn't wait until Monday. I had the company laptop with me. While having coffee, we talked about the trip and what the editing department needed to do. As we were chatting, a man came up and asked if he was Robert Walker. Robert said yes, and the man said, you've been served. Before he could say more, I gave him my laptop, company keys, credit cards, and handed him a letter of resignation for my jacket. Then I explained that his brother and my wife had also quit. His face went pale, and he asked how bad it was going to be. I said I was going to make sure they felt it. I have DNA proof that Stephen is the biological father of all of Deborah's children in mine. The lovers are being dealt with in their penthouse right now. Tell them they're legally required to stay 500 feet away from my mother, children, and me. I felt like poor Robert was about to lose his last serving. I got up and started to leave. Robert pounced on me in a rage. Before airport security could get to us. He was lying on the floor with blood running down his face. He would no longer be a handsome boy were it not for the large medical expenses. My mom and kids met me as I drove into the house, opening the garage door. It was hard to inform my two daughters and their brother that I was not their biological father. My mom lost her temper when I told them that their mother was now with the man who had become their father in their love shack. I told them that their relationship lasts longer than your mom and I have been married. For now, you will live with me until the court rules after you all have been interviewed. The court will look at all three of your parents' relationships with you before making a decision. All three were devastated and so was I. My mom heard someone trying to unlock the door and went to open it. I said no, that the outside alarm was still on. So I called the police, explaining that I wasn't supposed to be home and that someone was trying to break in. They said they were already responding to the silent alarm. That's when I sent the kids upstairs. They managed to get the front door open. Stephen was kicking out a window in the massive metal door, putting his hand through the door and trying to unlock the chain lock when the police showed up. Having apprehended the intruders, the policeman knocked and identified himself. When I opened the door, I saw Stephen and Deborah in handcuffs sitting in the back of the cruiser. When he said she claimed to live here, I handed him a copy of the restraining order that had been served this morning. He smiled and said, I guess they're both going to jail until they meet with the judge. My mother finally admitted that what she did to me years ago was wrong. It took her seeing what I was doing to realize the real cost. Not me, but her grandchildren. I'm no better than Debra, she said. Your father forgave me, but he was never the same. If he hadn't died in an industrial accident, I can't say we wouldn't be where you are now. Deborah and Steve's pictures were on the front page of the New York Post on Sunday morning as they were being led to the police station. I told the reporter on the court call the whole picture of what was going on. I stated that I was forced to resign from the firm because of Stephen's long-term relationship with my wife. This will be published in the press on Monday. The DNA comparison report between my children and the Walker brothers proved their parentage. She liked the fact that the president of Walker's adverting violated the moral high ground he had established. By interfering in my marriage, it was up to the board of directors to decide the matter. Carl and Carla Matthews, my children and I, shared a late Sunday dinner at a local restaurant, after which they followed us into our home. Their grandmother put my daughters to bed so my father-in-law and I could talk in my home office.
That, said I. Deborah and Steve's relationship started before I even met Deborah. I found out about their relationship when I was in Canada. I then showed him a video clip of Robert and Steve talking. He shook his head in amazement. It was clear to me that he had no clue about anything. I then showed him the purchase documents for the penthouse, which were two years earlier than the date of our marriage. The condo was still registered under her maiden name. Damn, Carl exclaimed. The day you got married, you were already an asshole. When I saw that clip, I hired a lawyer and a private investigator. Both of them thought they had protected themselves so well that it would be impossible to uncover the truth. I said quietly, I won't let what's happening in my life affect mom's relationship with you and your kids. I gave him my copies of court documents and reference materials. While he read them, I poured us both a large shot of Irish whiskey on the rocks. What hurt him the most was reading the conversation where Deborah openly admitted to a mutual friend how easily her parents, sibling, and I had been deceived. It was a decision made by both Stephen and her that I would raise his children. From the first time I met Glenn, I knew he would do anything for me. He was so deeply in love with me that he believed anything. His love made him so blind that he couldn't see what was right in front of him. Stephen, seeing Glenn's natural ability to notice the smallest details, made him his wand of choice on set. The cost of reshoots dropped by 80%. As a result, the company's reputation and profits skyrocketed. Glenn thought our home life was good. He never thought anything was wrong. And besides, he's a great father. When Terry, my youngest, graduates from high school, I will file for divorce and get him out of the picture. To do that, I'll use the escort services Stevens' firm provides. The bastard won't even know it's over. It will be very easy to get as much out of him as possible, she said with a laugh. I returned and saw my father-in-law crying. Where did you get all this from? Asked Carl seriously. I opened my laptop in front of him, went into my email and opened the latest email from Deborah's cell. I opened the video file and turned on his playback. Steve, this is frustrating as hell. I don't know how Glenn found out about this, said Deborah. He claims you're the children's father, but he hasn't shown us proof, so it's still the ramblings of his lawyer trying to build a case. What we're dealing with is just smoke and mirrors. Right, replied Steve. But Glenn resigned and served Robert on Saturday. Will he be serving corporate tomorrow? If so, that's when things will become clear. We're lucky the judge got off with a warning. Now I have to figure out what to tell the board of directors. I need to get my office, clothes, and personal belongings out of the house, so I'll be looking for a divorce lawyer tomorrow. Another thing I have to decide is what I'm going to tell my parents. Whatever I say, I have to make it seem like it's Glenn who's cheating, not me, and that you're just a friend helping me out. Do you think they'll buy that? Asked Steve. After all, we both know your kids are mine. They have no reason to doubt me because they've never caught me doing anything, so their faith and trust in me is assured, she replied. If I have any doubts, I will start crying. My tears have always brought them to their senses. After all, I've always been daddy's little girl. What about our three children? Do you want them to take my last name after we get married? Asked Stephen. Upon hearing this, I turned off the video because I almost cried. Deborah's diamond earrings have a camera built into them that charges wirelessly and transmits data over Wi-Fi when full. As long as they're charged and there's a signal, the information will be transmitted as long as she's wearing them. I said. Carla quietly came in and joined us. I offered her a glass of wine, and when she agreed, I left them alone to talk. I came back just in time to see Carl showing her the conversation we had overheard. Carla's expression said it all. Mom, with tears in her eyes, said, So the divorce papers are true. She cheated, but for how long? Dad replied, Longer than they were married. Our grandchildren are the result of our daughter and Stephen. Mom continued, I've seen the DNA report. Deborah has betrayed everything our family stands for. It's hard to accept because of all the lies she told over such a long time. She doesn't seem to regret anything, not even being caught. I wonder how many times we took the kids away so she could be with her real lover. But they're our grandchildren, Carla cried. I don't want to lose them. Mom, if I get custody, you'll always be able to see them. I reassured her. I told Dad that before we even started talking. I suggested that they both apply to the court for unlimited access to their grandchildren. 
no matter who gets custody. You'll have to sue all three of us, but I think it's the wisest thing you can do. That way you can tell Deborah that until this is over, you refuse to take sides. Don't let your emotions make you close doors that can't be opened later. Carl looked at me and nodded in agreement. Honey, our son-in-law Glenn will always be family to me. I think his wisdom on this matter is correct. He is in as much pain as we are, and yet he puts our needs first, Carl said. As far as we know, it seems that she and her lover don't care about their children at all. Our daughter has been lying to us her entire adult life. Where did we go wrong? I want to ask, when Deborah confessed her love for Glenn to us, was she telling the truth, said Mom. Monday was a busy day for me. I drove my three children to school and then spent time in the office explaining the situation. If my wife tried to contact the kids at school, the police would find out. My soon-to-be ex found herself an expensive divorce attorney and my former employer's firm was sued. On Wednesday, my father-in-law filed both Deborah and me. He told me that his daughter was furious and demanded that he withdraw his lawsuit. He told her that she and her mother didn't know what to believe, but felt that their relationship with their grandchildren should be protected. He asked her why she was denied access to the children. She refused to answer. Then he informed her that I had suggested that he make that decision after our family dinner on Sunday night. Now we know why you weren't invited. He made us promise that we would sue all of you because he didn't want our relationship with our grandchildren to suffer because of their parents' behavior. He's the one who gave us the address of your penthouse. That's how we knew where to sue you. According to city records, you're co-owners with Glenn's boss, which gives his claims more credibility. Deborah lost his temper and he hung up. This conversation told him a lot because, as human beings should, when confronted with the truth, most will run away. Luckily, Friday was the last day of school before spring break, so my in-laws, my three kids, my mom, and I went to Disneyland for a week, leaving on Saturday and coming back a week later. We had planned the trip weeks ago, but I couldn't get a discount on Deborah's ticket. I needed her to sign a deed for her share of the house instead of her corporation, paying part of the house expenses while we were married. I wanted her to believe it wouldn't be considered a marital asset in the divorce. She didn't realize her corporation would be involved because she ran it from home and its legal address was our house. Walker's Human Resources Department agreed to terminate my employment under those terms. So, I remained an employee of the company until my sick and vacation days were used up, giving me until the end of June to decide what to do. When I returned, my former assistant, Nora, told me the board of directors wanted to give me time to cool off before trying to work things out. They knew I was valuable to the firm and clients were asking if I would come back. Although the Walker brothers owned significant stakes in the corporation, they could both be removed for cause. In addition, the board of directors could force them to sell all of their stock. Therefore, the brothers hired an outside firm to analyze their options and deal with the consequences. Gordon allowed Deborah access to the garage where we moved all of her personal belongings after duplicating all of her corporation's business records, including all bank records, while we were gone. He had a team of forensic accountants analyze all of our children's parenting expenses to date, starting with the date of conception of the oldest. Using a semi-annual interest rate, he divided the cost of each year by three and calculated the cost of Steve Walker's involvement in my cuckoldry doubling it for undue stress and suffering, then added interest to bring it to present value. The second lawsuit against him was for alienation of affection. I also sued both brothers for interference with the marital relationship. I used the adultery ground against my wife. The kids had just gotten home from school when there was a knock on our front door. It was a social worker checking out a complaint about me not watching the kids. I learned that the call came from my soon-to-be ex-attorney. My son led her into the kitchen where she caught me and my daughters working together to prepare dinner. She smelled the roast cooking in the oven. When she explained why she had come, I told her to rummage through the cabinets, refrigerator, and freezer while I continued peeling potatoes. After complying with the request, I offered her a cup of coffee and pulled out a couple large mugs. Miss, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, I said. This is Trisha Marsh, Mr. James. She replied, I asked her to call me Glenn and then suggested that if she had time, she should interview my children right now, since I assumed the court would order it. Since dinner will be ready in an hour, 
We'd be happy to have you join us if you can, she agreed. My son Carl led her into the den and they talked while Tina and Terry helped me. After a nice dinner, Trisha talked with my daughters for a long time afterward. Carl and I did the dishes together. None of the kids had done their homework and I had to write them notes explaining why if anyone asked. Finally, Trisha and I were able to talk privately. The first thing I did was show her Stephen and Deborah's chat room. For over 16 years, you'd never suspected anything, Trisha said. They had everything planned out. It seems she wanted kids, but he didn't. So they chose you to raise his kids. That's how I see it, I replied. It makes me wonder if I really knew the woman I was married to. I'll make a note that our marriage was full of lies on her part. Trisha explained. The fact that they planned it all together makes you question if they truly cared about children. They seem to view the kids and you as obstacles they need to work around. Your wife's lawyer is trying to make it seem like you don't care about your children. But from what I've seen and heard, that's not true at all. I was surprised to hear that you told them Steve is their biological father. It's good to see that all three want to stay with you. Are you listed as the father on their birth certificates? Yes, I replied. That's very important. It shows that you didn't know and have been treating the children as your own all this time. It will be important to the court when the custody issue is decided, Trisha said. I will give you my email address so you can send me that clip because the judge will have to see it. Seeing situations like yours makes me realize once again why I never got married. I can't change the past, I said with a smile. Besides, I love my children regardless of who created them. They may not have my genes, but everything else about them is me. I like the way you look at it, Trisha said. I'll have to investigate your soon-to-be ex's house and interview them both. But right now the deck is tipped in your favor. The judge will take that point into account, which I wrote down in my notes for the report. I wrote that Glenn Allen James was chosen by Deborah because he was good enough to be the father of her children, but not good enough for her to let him be a father. Mr. James obtained legal proof that Mrs. James was in a common law relationship with Mr. Stephen Walker before and during their actual marriage. We chatted for another couple of hours, keeping things casual and promised to keep in touch. So we gave each other our cell phone numbers. It surprised her that Deborah had not contacted the children since the day of the application. She recorded this fact in her notes. I later learned that on the way home, she called a detective she knew to ask him if a crime had been committed. He said there had been, but he thought he should contact the prosecutor's office to see if they would be willing to prosecute. I was fortunate that the following year was an election year, and the district attorney ran for office. At the time, I didn't yet realize how big a storm cloud my situation had created. Waking up Tuesday morning, I busied myself with getting the kids ready for school. I was surprised to read that Trisha wanted me to send the video clip I showed her to the ADA. I did better than that. I emailed him all the clips and told him I would send him the rest of what came in. It took about three hours before he got a response. I was surprised when he called and explained that he had a court order last night for wiretaps, etc. So what he got from me could be used legally in criminal court without revealing my name. A very important point was that all the clips I had came from an email address. This gave the impression that it was all coming from a third party. He was going to build a case to charge them both with extortion. One charge for each year they defrauded me and my children. I said I hoped the charges would be filed before I had to go to divorce court. When the kids got home, we ordered pizza and had an early dinner because I wanted to watch the local evening news. The local CBS affiliate showed everything. Debra and Stephen were taken in for questioning as soon as they left the restaurant after dinner. For the next hour, I answered the phone and explained that I had no idea what was going on. The rest of the week went smoothly, so it seemed to me. I found out later that I was wrong. On Wednesday, I was seen entering the office building of a competitor of a former employer. No one knew I was meeting a friend for lunch. The next day, there was a mention in the gossip pages of the morning paper that I was negotiating with upper management to accept a position. I called the author of the article and told her that if she looked in the files again, she might have missed the name of the twin my wife was with when she was at the theater. How much have you both laughed at me? I suppose you are to be congratulated, since I heard that Steve and you are going to get married as soon as we are divorced. Not a single expression on her face changed during my entire tirade. 
Her response to my comments spoke volumes. We're not together. Steve had to find a new place to live. We were both served with a court order requiring us to have no contact with each other while being questioned by the detectives until they complete their investigation. For now, he had to move into a hotel, Deborah said. My lawyer messed it up when she filed the complaint against you with child services. They asked us questions. The condo management wants us to sell the condo, I explained. We were interviewed on Monday, I continued. The interviewer spoke to us separately, so I don't know what the kids told her. They're old enough that the court will let them choose where they want to live. They'll be staying with your parents this weekend. Without saying anything else, I turned and went back inside the house. I grabbed my laptop and went to the kitchen. I made a new pot of coffee and opened it up. I found out that a lot had happened since Monday. A human resources representative had used Roger's office to interview top to bottom management. It was sad to learn how many had laughed at me behind my back. Many were fired without explanation. For both my attorney and the prosecutor's office, this would have been a gold mine. It seems Stephen often used bribes, promotions, and blackmail to keep his relationship secret. All of this was a criminal offense. The board of directors and the CEO met late Thursday night after most of the employees had gone home. The board was fully briefed on who knew what, when it was done, and why it was done. Even former employees were interviewed. They discussed what should be done with Stephen and Robert. Stephen was finished as president of the firm, and Roger was to be forced out. The HR director told the CEO that I had been seen entering the commercial building and that according to her reliable sources, gossip columnists, I had been contacted by competitors. The CEO smiled and said, but can they offer him the position of president? The HR person picked up the phone and explained that she was on her way to see if Nora was still working. The CEO asked why. Nora was Glenn's assistant. She knows him better than anyone else. Thus, she can understand what he is thinking. Glenn. And then it hit me. Under state law, a civil relationship lasting more than a year was equivalent to marriage. I picked up the phone and called the DA's office. I explained my idea and he liked it. Legally, Deborah could be charged with bigamy as soon as they could prove their relationship. I gave them Gordon's office number and asked them to fax copies of everything we had. Two hours later, Gordon called. Dan it, Glenn. I didn't see this and I should have. This is great. Your divorce is a grand affair, and Deborah will be indicted within hours. George Davidson, who is leading the DA's investigation into the two of them, said, You brought it up. I'm withdrawing your divorce case. Instead, we're filing for an annulment because legally she was already considered married. All that's left on my side is to work out the details, I said. Even that won't be difficult with Deborah in jail. Gordon laughed. It's funny how they've gotten away with all this scheming and planning for so long. Their own behavior is what incapacitates them and makes our other suits that much stronger. Speaking of which, wait until I email everything I have backed up. Call the Diaz office and see if the wiretap authorization can be extended. If so, it will save me thousands of dollars, I said. Specify that the next letter from me will include evidence of criminal offenses. Maybe not but I'm asking that she be ordered to foot your legal bill, Gordon replied. Glenn, are you serious? I've obtained copies of confessions from employees and former employees about what Steve did to keep his common law marriage secret. I'll send them to you, said I. I went back to my laptop and watched a video of the CEO, CFO, and the head of HR talking. They all agreed that my case wasn't going to end well for them. They could try to defend themselves, but the negative attention it would bring would harm their reputation. They decided they should try to settle the case with me for as little money as possible. Within five minutes, the DA's office and my attorney sent them all the emails I had received. Then my phone rang. It was Nora. Hey, long time no see, I said. Glenn, things are chaotic. Every department is affected. In HR, everyone is being interviewed one-on-one. -on -one. They brought in a notary to witness and verify. We lost some good people. Some were fired, others left, Nora said. Steve and Robert were called in. After meeting with the CEO, security let Steve clean off his desk and then escorted him out. Robert was told he was being relieved of all his duties until they decided what to do with him. Is your job safe? I asked. I indicated in my resignation letter that you were the most qualified to take my position. That's what they told me. 
Right now, I'm acting duties. No final decision will be made until the board finds a new president. The only thing they have told me is that the person they are interested in has a situation that needs to be resolved. My intuition tells me it's you. After all, Stephen or Robert never did anything unless they consulted you first. Well, they learned with great difficulty and expense that half the time they were heard but not listened to. I optimize by focusing on the important things, ignoring all the various bells and whistles that our customers often thought were important. When presented with the final product, they were happy with our results, I said. My phone has been busy since I left, but I'm not committing to anything for now. Thank you, Glenn. You told me what I needed to know without telling me anything specific. So you're still okay with coming back, said Nora. Depends, I laughed. You can send the Gossip Girl's email address if you have one from your personal account. No problem, but I'll send it to you from my cell phone, Nora replied. Using the email account, no one knew that I had sent the Gossip Girl all the videos that weren't part of my divorce case. Every little detail she could get out of them would be made public in print. Without naming names, she wrote in such a way that there was no doubt who she was addressing. The writer was a master of her craft. My son came running in from the living room while I was preparing for dinner. Dad, Mom, it's the early news. I walked in and scrolled back a page to see what was happening. She was being led away in handcuffs. On the next newscast, the spokesperson informed everyone that she was being charged with being married to two men at the same time in the eyes of the law. Can she go to jail on that charge if she is found guilty? Asked Carl. Yes, it is considered a felony in this state. What kind of sentence she gets depends on the judge, I replied. My dad used to tell me if you can't do time, don't do the crime. That stopped me from doing a lot of stupid things when I was your age. How long will they keep her? My son asked. Until she goes before a judge and can post bail, I answered. Depending on which ward she's in, she may already be released. Carl and Carla stopped by to pick up the kids. The boys would be going to the monster truck competition on Saturday morning. The girls had two soccer games coming up and I needed to get out of the house. I can't believe it, Carl said. Deborah has been arrested on bigamy charges. She could get up to 10 years depending on the judge. I note that, and it's going to get worse before it gets better, I replied. It seems her lover used bribes, threats, and blackmail to cover up their relationship. The DA's office got video evidence from those who were victimized by Steve. I felt sorry for Carl because his daughter must have been tearing his heart out. Suddenly, I was alone. I shouldn't have been because I was depressed mentally and emotionally. I felt like I had hit rock bottom. I sat on the stairs and cried, unable to stop. Some people say depression is a way of healing or coping. But if this was healing, what's hell like? The human body, with all its emotions, is fragile. No matter what we plan, we can't control how or when it finds release. Three hours later, I sat in a local park feeding unsalted peanuts to squirrels, feeling lost. Many people don't realize how lonely divorce can be. Others feel isolated because they don't know who or what to believe anymore. And then there's the new feeling of being single while all your friends are married. Being single meant that in many situations you no longer fit in with society. I was lost in thought completely oblivious to everything around me. I didn't see or hear the man who sat down on the other end of the bench. I saw you sitting there and I watched you for a while. It became painfully clear to me that Squirrel seemed to have become your best friends. I wondered if it had gotten to you and how you were handling Glenn. I guess I found out, said Trisha Marsh. The blues suck, don't they? You've got to find your own way to get rid of them. Easier said than done. Divorce, as I've learned, is something you have to go through alone. Most of your friends avoid you like it's contagious, I replied. Come on, I'll buy you coffee, Trish said. No business talk, okay. I agreed. I found out that Trish was off to do her weekly shopping, so I joined her. It was interesting to learn her taste in food. She bought mostly frozen fast food for herself because when she had no one to cook for, she lost interest. I knew this was the case with my mother. The problem was that their diet suffered along with it. I had my own shopping cart, and she would see me pick up a few groceries. As we approached the deli counter, I asked the vendor for 12 fresh wontons and a quarter pound of roast duck. I hope you like wonton soup, I replied, because that's what I'll make for dinner if you agree. I don't mind since we're only a block or two from my apartment, 
Trish said. After washing the vegetables, she watched me cut them into equal portions. I told her I was using chicken broth because the wontons I'd gotten had more pork than beef in them. In the same manner, I chopped up the pre-prepared duck. She took out two pots. In one I poured water and some salt, and in the other I poured broth. Once the broth was boiling, I put in the corn, water chestnut spices, and the duck. I saved the red, yellow, and green peppers and snow peas for last. When the salted water was boiling, I added the wontons to cook. Before draining the water from the wontons, I added fresh vegetables to the soup and then put two drops of soy sauce on top. After tasting it, I added some garlic powder. Finally, I put the wontons in the soup and let them soak up the flavor. Then I served it on the table. As soon as Trish tasted it, she was happy. I made enough for several bowls so she could have leftovers. During our chat, she found out I liked to make lots of wontons and freeze them for later. Another trick I explained was to use a little less broth and add cornstarch as a thickener to make the dish a stew that could be served over rice. When she found out how little I had spent, she was shocked. I left her house in a good mood. Trish had accepted me for who I was. Surprisingly, it was what I needed all along. Recognizing who you are helps you go a long way, and today it moved mountains. On Sunday, while reading the morning paper, I noticed a two-page story in Gossip Cop about the former president's ongoing efforts to maintain power and control over his personal situation. This included everything from promotions, blackmail, and bribery. At the end of the article, the question was asked, is this being investigated? If not, why not? I texted Trish and asked if she wanted to go to Coney Island with me. She said yes. On our first date, we acted like teenagers. I asked her why she never got married. She explained that her career had always gotten in the way, and being called out too often was really messing up the relationship. I understood this from both sides because my career had affected me. My relatives and my children were surprised at my good mood when I met them for Sunday dinner. They all remarked that they hadn't seen me this happy in weeks. Monday morning, Nora called to let me know that I should expect a surprise visit from the chairman of the board of directors as they begin the dance to bring me back. An article that appeared in the Sunday paper made it happen because everyone knew who she was referring to. Nora informed me that the board was going to go to court to get a court order to force Steve and Robert to sell their shares as they were refusing to do so since they were no longer employed. Unexpected was a call from Deborah, who asked if we could meet privately in a neutral location with no cell phones. I asked her to give me 10 minutes to think about it and call her back. I called Gordon, who told me that sometimes the best place to have a private conversation is in the middle of a crowd where people can move around freely. I ended up meeting Deborah at the Nathan's hot dog stand in the park at one o'clock in the afternoon. We found a bench to sit on. We pulled out our cell phones and turned them off, leaving them in plain sight. What do you need, Debra? I asked coldly. I need to know if you know who's doing this to Steve and me, Debra said bluntly. Gossip girl is pressuring the police, almost directing them. Steven's corporation that he founded kicked him out. Robert thinks he was kicked out too, and now you file for an annulment. Well, Stephen's problem comes from the board of directors, I believe. I have been informed that it is the source of the information the police get. Because of that, they have been able to discover facts and witnesses to events, I said. I can't discuss anything about our situation because my lawyer doesn't want me to. Then why did you agree to meet with me? Asked Deborah. You know, we have dug ourselves a huge hole. I was informed that Miss Marsh took her report to the court late last week. We were told that all the children want to stay with you. Given what Stephen and I are facing, I have to agree. Another lawyer says I'm facing a lot of jail time if the judge hearing the case agrees that, legally speaking, I was married to Stephen. In his opinion, it comes down to a matter of interpretation as to whether it is a marriage since he does not have a marriage certificate. I need to be able to tell my three children that I saw you today, I replied. They will be asking my opinion on how you look. How are they doing emotionally? Asked Deborah with genuine concern. They have their moments. At times it's bad because I can't explain or answer their questions, I said. What questions? Asked Deborah, looking for a way back into their lives. What did they do to deserve such a punishment? Even I've asked myself that question several times. You should write a book about being married to two men for almost 20 years. 
With that kind of interest, it will become a bestseller. With those words, I got up and left. Deborah was always focused on herself. She was like an old dog that never changed. What's worse, I couldn't even feel sorry for her because I realized I didn't have any emotions left. When I got home, I checked my email and found a video of me there. Deborah's voice was loud and clear in the chat. I forwarded it to the gossip columnist with a huge smile on my face. On Tuesday, the gossip column printed in big letters that bigamist Deborah James was planning to write a book called Tell All About Her 18 Years as the Wife of Two Men. This news made Carl and Carla Matthews even angrier because it seemed like their daughter was proud of what she had done. Gordon called me Wednesday night with good news. The day in divorce court had gone well. The judge agreed that in terms of state law, she was already married when we got married. Since we were not legally married, the annulment was granted. This gave him some leeway on the division of all assets. Although Deborah's attorney stubbornly resisted, the judge ruled that since she worked from home, Deborah's corporation should be considered a marital asset. He ruled the 65 to 35 split in my favor. Each would pay their own attorney fees. Deborah's attorney tried to convince him of a more equitable division. He replied that since her first husband was not listed in this divorce and he was involved in the scam, I would award Glenn James his share. I had to agree that we had hit her hard. I was granted temporary sole custody of the children until her criminal problems were resolved but I had to allow her unrestricted access to her children. Stephen Walker was arrested Friday, and suddenly many people he had mistreated over the years found themselves in a legal situation requiring them to cooperate with the district attorney's office. Deborah's life was going downhill. Until a couple months ago, she had two lovers who kept her warm at night. Now she had none. I was busy working on the landscaping around the house when the chairman of the board showed up. We need to have a serious face-to-face -face talk about this mess, Glenn. I hope you had plenty of time, said Bill Burroughs. I stood up and extended my hand to Bill and he took it. It wasn't about the firm, I said. It was all about the people who work in it. He smiled big and said, Thanks, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Let's try to figure this out. We went to my kitchen and talked about my situation. I learned some things and so did Bill. What impressed me most was how honest he was. He didn't hide anything. It was reassuring to hear that after they sued to make them sell their controlling stake, they agreed to change it from common stock to preferred stock. This meant they lost their voting rights in the company. I told them that was one of my worries. He analyzed each layoff one by one, explained the reasons, and talked about the people who had quit. I told him there were a few people I would like to try to rehire if I came back, because in a way they were in the same situation as me. You can't blame people for something they didn't know. I was caught off guard by the amount he offered on behalf of the firm to settle the lawsuit. I called Gordon who talked to Bill. I told Gordon to go along with it. He then pulled out a contract to be president of the firm and held it out to me. I know you won't do anything until your lawyer gets his hands on the paycheck, Bill said. While you're waiting for it to be ready, review this. I think you'll be more than satisfied. When he left, I marveled at the time. We had talked for over three hours. I called Tricia, hoping she wasn't busy today. She wasn't busy. I asked her if she wanted to join my family for a holiday dinner. What are we celebrating? She asked. My divorce, getting custody, settling a lawsuit against my former employer, and my possible return to work. She agreed. I phoned the restaurant, which had a small private area, to check if it was available. Luckily, it was free. I made reservations for 8 o'clock that evening. Then I called my in-laws, my mom, my sister, and her husband, and they all said they could come. I asked my sister to bring the kids along. I also called Trisha and told her I'd pick her up at 7. On our way, we stopped at Trisha's house so I could buy a mix of red and yellow roses with ferns and a lovely vase to thank her for all she had done. During the drive, the kids playfully teased me about falling in love, sharing what they liked about her. I left the kids in the car and went up to her apartment by myself when she let me in. Trisha loved the flowers and she looked amazing. Trisha Marsh was wearing a pretty yellow dress the color of early summer. Her blue eyes sparkled with wonder. She had prepared herself to make a good impression, and she did. Since you brought flowers, Trisha giggled. Does that mean you consider this our first date? 
I didn't know what to say and stammered as I tried to speak. Trisha smiled and took my hand. It's been a while since I've made a man lose his breath, Trisha said with a smile. I'll take that as a yes. To this day, I can't forget that moment. We got in the car. The kids were gushing about me winning custody to her. I told her who else was coming to the party. Trisha replied, wow, I'm meeting family on our first official date. Tammy, my oldest daughter, who took her maternal grandmother Carla's example, said she really liked the flowers my daddy bought for her. Trisha then showed her a picture of them, and it became her home screen. Due to traffic, we were 10 minutes late. I had pre-ordered two bottles of one of their best sellers, a medium champagne. Before I even started introductions, Terry, my youngest daughter, told me that this was Trisha Marsh, our father's girlfriend. Trisha and I burst into laughter. It set the mood for the whole evening. At dinner, I explained the court order and its rulings to everyone. Then I talked about the pending settlement of the lawsuit against the firm and the fact that Robert and Stephen Walker had been removed from their management positions. The final piece of news was that I had been offered the position of president. Patricia explained that she was the social services representative called in to verify a complaint against me. And that's how we met. Carl stood up with champagne in his hand. After all you've been through, Glenn, Carl and I were afraid you would cut us out of your life. Instead, you made us closer. Congratulations, you're finally getting the respect you deserve. Cheers to Glenn for being himself, and to Trisha for bringing joy back to his life. As we were getting ready to leave, Carl pulled me aside and said we would take the kids for the weekend. He mentioned we could use our keys to grab whatever we needed. He advised not to dwell on the past, but to focus on building a new life. I asked Trisha if she liked dancing and we hit the road. I dropped her off at 3 in the morning and planned to pick her up at noon. We ended up spending most of the weekend together. On Monday morning, after walking the kids to school, I checked out the job offer. It offered more than double my previous salary and included stock bonuses and a signing bonus with two options, cash or common stock. Bill had already signed it. I called the business attorney to go over the legal terms and ensure I hadn't overlooked anything. While doing laundry at 10 in the morning, there was a knock on my door. I was surprised to see a short, petite Asian woman named Lin Wong, also known as Gossip Girl. After introducing myself, I invited her in and offered her coffee or tea. She replied, if you have a nice strong shot of gin, that would be fine. A little early for me, I thought, but that was Oka. I brought her one, and being a gentleman, joined her, sipping my beer. Sorry to bother you, Mr. James, she said, but I want to show you the video. Telling her to go ahead, I found out that it was a conversation between Debra and me. She then showed a conversation in which my wife claimed that she had never intended to write a book. She wanted a retraction so she could start an appeal in her divorce case. Mr. James, I need your perspective before I make a decision on what to do, explained Lin Wong. I asked her to turn on the recording equipment and let me know when I could start. She said, Mrs. First of all, you have permission to print my name. What you showed me is only part of our conversation that day. We discussed other things like our children and our divorce. In the 18 years of our marriage, we all realized that everything she told me was nothing more than lies. As a result of everything that has happened, I can't claim that everything she says is true, I explained since everything she told me that I believed was a lie. I wanted to ask you, did she lie to you too? I can't say that she didn't lie. And that's what makes it sad in the first place. Since I wasn't worth being honest, I don't think she was worth lying to either. I hope this helps clear things up for you. She replied that yes, it would help, and turned off the device. I think I'll use my column to do a little survey. I'll write her conversation with me word for word. Underneath will be our conversation we just finished. I'll ask readers who they believe. I look forward to reading it, said I quite sincerely. My father had always believed that if you gave a man enough rope, sooner or later he would hang himself. Deborah was proving him right. For her, it was all about the money she was losing. I knew it. I think Mrs. Wong saw it too. My ex called and said she'd like to take our kids out to dinner. I said that they would all be home just after 4 p.m and that she should come over then. She showed up shortly after that. The door was opened by my oldest daughter. I heard her yell out, but all I heard was the sound of running feet. I stayed where I was in the kitchen. 
I didn't want to be accused of interfering with my ex's relationship with our children. A few minutes later, I heard the front door close. Shortly afterward, my children walked in. We told her it's too soon, Daddy, Tammy said, because it is. We can't accept what she's done to all of us. That's what we told her. I said that if I did anything against a friend, Terry said, I'd probably lose his friendship for life. And you want us to go on with our lives like nothing happened. I just told her to go to hell, Carl said. She asked who gave you the right to say that. I told her my grandfather. To change the subject, I asked who wanted MCDs for dinner. Everyone agreed. After the kids did their homework, I called Trisha and explained what had happened. She said I shouldn't have been surprised. Even though you tried to hide it, they could still tell you were deeply hurt. It seemed like Stephen's legal issues were really affecting him. He instructed his legal team to settle the matter as cheaply as possible. Robert quit his job and decided to sue me for the damage to his face. That Friday, after my attorney made some adjustments, I signed the contract and called Bill. We agreed to make an announcement the next Friday. I shared the news with Gossip Girl. My mother offered to take the kids for the weekend. Trisha was busy with another case. In my spare time, I tried to track down a few people who had quit. Two, whom I thought were key to my reorganization plans, agreed to return as soon as I showed them my new contract stipulating that the head of human resources quit or be removed from his position. I learned that they had approached her to warn her about what Stephen was doing, but they were ignored. It was very amusing to read Mrs. Wong's comments. After she recounted word for word the conversations Debra and I had, she asked readers for their thoughts. Then she wrote, having met these two, she said, I had to wonder what Debra even found in Glenn. He gives the impression of a kind, loving, and considerate man. The kind of man any woman would want to have. Debra is a hunter, always seeking thrills and power from those with whom she can never find the happiness she craves. She will be what you want her to be because she doesn't know herself or feel comfortable in her own skin. She puts a mask on everyone she meets and it's not makeup on her face. Deborah James used Stephen Walker as much as he used her. That is what helped them keep their relationship alive. As I read this book, I thought it hit the spot. On Monday, I contacted a service that was looking for a housekeeper to work Monday through Friday. With my new salary level, I could afford it. I called the chairman of the board of directors and let him know what I had learned. When he found out they were telling the truth, she was let go. That night, talking to Tricia, I asked her if she knew anyone who burned out working in their field. She asked me why. I told her I was searching for a human resources manager who had been let go from the company. She said she knew two people who would be great for that job. I asked her to have both of them get in touch with me. On the last Friday morning of May, in front of the press, the chairman of the board introduced me as the new president. I informed the media that our company had faced a staffing crisis and we were now moving forward with a new team. I introduced the two new vice presidents, explaining that they had both left their positions because of the previous management's behavior. I emphasized that we wanted all our employees to be honest and have integrity from now on. Then, I introduced the new head of human resources, highlighting that we were the first organization to hire a former social worker for this role because we aim to have higher moral and mental standards. I asked my former assistant, Nora Richards, to stand up. We are very pleased to announce that Nora Richards has been appointed to the newly created position of vice president. Handling all aspects of commercial production on our production team, I said. Nora was greeted with a round of applause. Thus, it was made clear that dedication and hard work meant something. Deborah fought the bigamy charge, lost, and is serving a sentence of two years minus one day. Stephen settled all lawsuits and is serving a 10-year sentence. Robert is appealing his defeat for the third time. Trisha Marsh and I continue to date, and the kids push us to set a wedding date. Second story, my female 56. Husband of 34 years cheated on me with my daughter's 18 years old best friend. My husband of 34 years, age 58, cheated on me with an 18 year old. Me and my husband have had a perfect marriage for the past 34 years. We have four daughters together who have all become successful and had kids of their own menace our youngest age 17 Annie, who we had 16 years after our first. Annie still lives with us as she is senior in high school. Annie is very popular and quite often has friends over on the weekend and after school. 
Annie has a best friend named Bailey, age 18, who is almost always at our house. Bailey has formed a very good relationship with my husband and I. She comes to church with us most Sunday mornings and often comes to family gatherings. About a month ago, I started realizing Bailey and my husband would often watch movies together on the weekends after Annie fell asleep. I didn't think much of it in the beginning, but grew more uncomfortable with it as it continued almost every weekend for over a month. I even walked into the living room to see my husband cuddling with my daughter's friend on my couch. Two days ago, I asked Annie about the situation and found out Annie had no clue this was going on and said she was going to express to Bailey how uncomfortable she felt about the situation. Annie also informed me of a situation Bailey had with another one of my daughter's friend's dad where she would get him alone and talk badly about his wife to try and trick him into sleeping with her. Today, I got up the courage to go through my husband's phone. I know it's an invasion of privacy, but a woman's intuition is never wrong. The first thing I checked was his messages. I found the contact with Bailey's name and clicked on the messages. When I looked at the messages, all I saw was a message from my husband that said, I can't wait to do it again next weekend, with a winking emoji. The response from Bailey read, I can't wait till you're out of that place and we can do it every day. I haven't said anything to husband or daughter about this yet, one. Because I don't want to jump to conclusions and ruin the past 34 years of marriage with my husband and two. Ruin my daughter's friendship and reputation at school. I want to confront my husband, but I also don't want to ruin my daughter's life. What should I do? If you like this video, subscribe Relation Tales.